Let's start reading in verse 9 this morning. Acts chapter 27, verse 9. It says, Now when much time had been spent, and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship, but by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suited to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening towards the southwest and the northwest, and winter there. Now when the wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called the Eurocliden. And when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Claudia, we secured a skiff with we secured the skiff with difficulty. And when they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship and feared lest they should run aground on the citrus sands. And they struck sail, so they were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. And on the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after a long absence without food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all and all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe that God, that it will be just as it was told to me. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we're so thankful that we can gather. Lord, I'm excited to be back and gathering again in person. But God, we thank you that still through the internet and media and the hard work of the staff here, God, we are able to meet right now and be able to interact with one another, Lord, via chat bars and, and, and in the homes that we're gathered in right now. And I pray that your presence would be present everywhere that we are and you be ministering to our hearts for what we're going through and what we're facing in our world today and we pray that in jesus name amen amen well including wednesday nights there are only four studies left in the book of acts two sundays two wednesdays and so you don't have to hear this much longer but i hope you got it down the book of acts is written by who church It is written by Luke. That's right. I can hear you in your homes. It's written by Luke. The same guy that wrote the Gospel of Luke wrote the book of Acts. And we are so thankful, right, that we have the book of Acts. Why? Because the book of Acts is the bridge. The bridge between the New Testament Gospels, the story of Jesus, and the New Testament epistles, the letters that the church leaders wrote to the early church. And without it, we might be a little lost because we would come to John 21 and Jesus would be alive, about to send to heaven and then what the next chapter would be romans 1 we would say wait 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 where's where's why is the church in rome and who's this paul guy and why should we trust him but we don't ask those questions why because we have the book of acts that's right and the other thing that's great about the book of acts it's one of the only books that comes with its own divine outline that's right it wasn't me that outlined the book it was paul no it wasn't paul either it was jesus christ better than paul it was jesus it was jesus who there in acts chapter 1 verse 8 said that you will receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in jerusalem judea samaria and to the ends of the earth and as you know well by now the book of acts follows that outline exactly the first seven chapters, the church is located in the city of Jerusalem. Then because of the persecution happening there and be under the leadership of Philip, the church moves on to the area of Judea and Samaria, the southern and central parts of the nation of Israel. And then in chapter 10, under the leadership of first the apostle Peter and then the apostle Paul, the church moves out from Israel to the ends of the earth. 
And that's where we are as we come to the end of the book. The church is moving once again to the ends of the earth and we'll see it impact the island of Malta next week because of what's happening here in chapter 27. And we'll see the gospel impact the city of Rome as Paul gets there in chapter 28. But this Wednesday night, we're going to see chapter 27 of the book of Acts in its entirety. And what we're going to see is Paul is heading to Rome. But I'm sure, as we'll get a little taste this morning and see in its entirety on Wednesday night, I'm sure when Paul first envisioned going to Rome, he's been he's been thinking about it for a long time, as we'll talk about in more in more depth a couple weeks from now when we get to the book of Romans. Paul writes Romans when he is ministering in Corinth. And as he's sitting there in that city, I know he's just, man, what it's gonna be like to be in Rome someday. What it's gonna be like to walk through those streets and preach the gospel. And I'm sure he imagined how he would get there. Well, I'm sure it didn't fit exactly how Paul got here in this tempest-tossed storm of a trip uh, there to uh, the city of Rome. But we'll find him getting there and how he did it this Wednesday night. And as we look at this journey, it's just really interesting to me. We'll put a map up and we'll show you the different ports that they, they stopped at and what Paul would have encountered at every port. And as we do that, the story just really comes alive. Then we'll talk for a few minutes this Wednesday night about the, 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 the kind of the balance between the sovereignty of God and man's free will. You know, it's been a debate that's been raging in the church for almost 500 years now. And so I think it's a little presumptuous for me to say that we're going to finally figure it out this Wednesday night. But there is some fascinating things that happen in Acts chapter 27 that I think shed some great light on this debate. Is God ultimately sovereign, meaning he makes all the decisions and we're just kind of pawns that, that kind of are his you know, play, play pieces? Or are we free and, and we make decisions and he responds to those decisions? What, what does the Bible have to say? Not does what some theologian have to say. What does the Bible have to say? I think that's so important for you as a Christian to have a real biblical stance when it comes to those things. But this morning, I have dropped you right in the middle of chapter 20 right in the middle of what we're going to cover this Wednesday night. And Paul is in his journey on his way to Rome. And the rest of the crew in the ship, they are about to head into a storm. You know, I don't know about you, but I just wish storms were not part of the Christian life. Don't, don't, you, don't you agree with me? Wouldn't it be great to have a Christian life free from trials? I wish the things we learned by trusting God when the world is on its ear. I, I wish we could learn those things when the world was great and everything was fine. I wish we could learn those things not by going through the trial, but by taking the, you know, the correspondence course. Don't you? I, I like remote learning when it comes to trials. I don't actually want to go through that trial. I want to watch online. And I want to take some notes. That's how I feel. I know that's probably how you feel too, but that's not our reality, is it? And yet sometimes the enemy wins a victory before even the storm really hits because he convinces us we're the only ones that go through difficult things. And yet the reality is, as we open up our hearts and minds to the world around us, we see that's not true. Many people who know Jesus and love Jesus have difficult seasons in their lives. And even if perchance you just don't nobody who suffers, number one, I want to be a better friend of yours because I want to be part of that group that you know that never suffers. But if, if that's you, you just you don't know anybody that suffers, well, we open up the scripture and what do we see? We see the scripture is chock full of wonderful men and women who love God, are devoted to God, but have serious, difficult things happen to them, and they have to learn to trust God and cling to God in the midst of their trials and storms. Well, that's exactly what we have in the text before us this morning. As we watch Paul and the gang go through this storm, and we watch how they handle it and what they learn through it, there is much that it can teach us as we go through our own difficulties in this life. I want you to note three things if you're taking notes this morning, three ways to kind of unpack the text that is before us. I want us to see, first of all, the situation that Paul and the crew were in and how they got into that situation. Then secondly, I want us to look at the storm itself. And then finally, I want us to see the solution that Paul comes up with from the Lord, of course, on how to deal with this storm that they were in. So look at those one at a time. Look back to verse 9 with me and we'll see the situation that Paul was in. It says in verse 9, Now when much time had been spent... 
and the sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of cargo on the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by the thing spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and the northwest, and winter there. The situation. So you understand the situation. Paul has spent almost three years of his previous life here, the life he's been living, the three years in Caesarea there in Israel. He first stood trial before the emperor Felix, or the, sorry, the governor Felix, and then he stood f- trial before the governor Festus and, and Herod Agrippa. And after all of these trials, after all of these defense of who he was, Paul realizes he isn't going to get a fair shake. So Paul does what is the right of every Roman citizen. Paul appeals to Caesar. He says, I want this case. I want my case heard before Caesar. And if a Roman citizen was to do that in a Roman court, well, it was now up to the Roman governor of the region to find that Roman citizen, first of all, a a, a Roman escort, a guard to take them, just the prisoner wouldn't run and be free, but also a ship for them to be able to get to Rome. And so Festus finds a Roman soldier. He assigns Paul to that soldier. Festus finds a ship and Paul is on his way to Rome. And on Wednesday night, we will get into the specifics of the journey, the ports they stopped at and why that was important to this journey. But as we come to verse nine, what's important for you to know for the study this morning is the journey was taking longer than expected. The winds on this journey were never, ever in their favor since leaving Israel. And they had lost much time fighting against the wind. And so the time of year it was at this moment was mid-October. And we know that because of something Paul says there in verse 9. He says then that the fast was over. And when Dr. Luke mentions that, as Dr. Luke puts that into the record of the book of Acts, the fast he is speaking of was not one that he and Paul and, you know, and and a couple of the guys were doing. He's speaking about a certain feast in Jerusalem that honestly isn't a feast at all. It's a day of fasting, a day of mourning, a day of self-inspection. It's called the Day of Atonement. When Jews, even to this day, they look and remember the things that they have done. And of course, in that day, they would offer a sacrifice for the nation of Israel in in national repentance for their sin. It was not a a day of eating. It was a day of fasting, a day of mourning. But but we know when that is because the day of atonement would happen any time from what is on our calendar to late September, as it is this year, to early October, as it was last year. And so because the fast was over, the Day of Atonement was done, we are now sometime in early to to mid-October. And though that's still summer for us who live here in the Coachella Valley, uh, mid-October is getting into fall and heading deeply into winter for the rest of the world. And storms begin to start up and sea travel, especially in the first century, well, it becomes almost impossible Open sea travel in the first century would stop somewhere in late September and it would start up again in late, late February. And so being in early October or mid-October, they are in the danger zone. And Paul sensing this, that the, they're not going to get to Rome in time, sensing this, he says to them in verse 10, I perceive this voyage will end in disaster. And that word perceive there is a very interesting one. It means to perceive from past experiences. Paul had been on many ocean journeys in his missionary journeys he had been on and no doubt even before he was a Christian going back and forth from 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 Tarshish and Sicilia and down into Israel and so he had been on many ocean journeys in fact when you you read you know the book of first Corinthians he lets us know that he had been shipwrecked three times so he's he's already been shipwrecked three times and I'm sure he's not looking for a fourth he doesn't want to have that experience a fourth time in his life and so he says 
hey, I, I just know from past experience, this is not a great time. It seems like we're, we're pressing against what we're supposed to be doing. The winds have never been in our favor. We should stop and winter here. And he tells this to the centurion. He tells it to the centurion, not the centurion is the captain of the ship, but the centurion was the ranking officer. And because this was an imperial grain ship, we'll see that on Wednesday night as we get into all the details of the journey, this was a, a ship owned by Rome, therefore the centurion was the ranking officer and had the final word. And so he listens to Paul, he's building a relationship with Paul, he hears that Paul is nervous, but he understandably gives more weight to the advice of the captain and the owner of the ship. And, and that makes sense. I mean, you know, I think this is exactly what I would do too. Do you want sailing advice from a guy who preaches the gospel for a living and makes tents on the side to, to provide for himself? Or do you want sailing advice from sailors, from people whose job it is to, to live and work on the ocean? Well, I'll, I'll pick the sailors every single time. And so the captain and the sailors want to get to the port of Phoenix, which was about 40 miles from where they were there in Fair Havens. And when the wind starts to blow in the direction of Phoenix, that's all the confirmation they need. In fact, I just imagine the captain and some of the, some of the, the, the sailors that were in charge just looking at Paul and saying, don't you ever... Don't you ever try to, to be and, and tell me how to sail again. Don't you ever tell me that. I'm sure they, 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 they had their big statement of saying these things, but they felt that way until when? Until the storm rolled in. Look at the storm, starting in verse 13. It says, When the south wind blew softly, supposing they attained their desire, they put out to sea and they sailed close by the island of Crete. We'll put all the maps up on Wednesday night. But not long after, a tempestuous, a tempestuous headwind arose called a Euroclidon. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of the island, of the island called Crete, Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty, and when they had taken it on board, they used the cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run aground on the, 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 the Sertra sands, they struck sail and were so driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship, and on the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our hands. Now, when the sun, or when the, neither stars nor sun appeared for many days, nor small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would finally be saved was given given up. But after a long absence from food, Paul stood in the midst of him and said, and we'll get to what he says in just a second. But in verse 14, we're told long before they, they find themselves, Luke says they find themselves, they, they, leave, they leave the island of Crete, they find themselves in a Euroclidon. Now a Euroclidon comes from two Greek words that means a wind coming from the east and from the north. So like from, from the area of what is Russia to where they are in the Mediterranean Sea, and it's pushing west and south. So it's pushing down towards Africa, towards the other side of the Mediterranean Sea, and it's common in the Mediterranean world in winter months. It's feared by even sailors today with all of our modern ships because of the violence of the wind and the storms and the waves it produces. It's been described by sailors today as a miniature hurricane in the region with swirling strong winds and this grain ship is hit by this Euroclide and it's pushed out to sea away from the island of Crete and the harbor of Phoenix out into the deep ocean which in all normal cases would mean the end of the ship and the end of the lives on that ship. The sailors and even the prisoners do all they can to try to stop it. They try lightening the load. They try ropes around the boat, thinking that it will hold the boat together, being impacted by the waves. They even try to let down anchors to try to keep it from being pushed further south. They, wanna, they think they might end up on the citrus sands. Now, we are going to put this map up in front of you. And here, I just want to show you how far off course they are because of this storm. The red arrow on that, on that map in front of you is pointing to Fair Havens, a, a, a port there on the island of Crete. So, so that's where they were, 
And look at where they're worried about going, the, the little circle down at the bottom of the map. That's where the citrus sands are. Now, that's, that's not a lake. That's the Mediterranean Sea. That's, that's so far off course, but this is how far and how, how hard this wind was pushing them again further toward the west and further toward the south. And as we see how far they are off course, they start to give up hope. And they think we are never going to make it out of this alive. And as I was thinking on this text this week, I just see in this text some reasons they found themselves in trouble. And it's really important for us to know sometimes what causes difficulties in our life. I mean, maybe you're, you're watching this morning and you think, you know, my life is just too easy. What I really want is some trials. <laughs> what I really want is some difficulties in my life. Yes, that would make life so much better. If that's how you feel this morning, well, first of all, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and you need to book an appointment with Pastor Dave. I'm too busy to, uh, to deal with that kind of a counseling appointment. But, but, but we'd love to minister to you because that's, that's just strange. No one shows up and says, hey, I want to have trials. But it's important for us to see why they came so that we can avoid them in our lives. Why, why were they led into the storm? Well, the first reason, write it down, think it through, pray it in. They, were, they moved out in impatience. In impatience. You see, it was, it was obvious to Paul that the, 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 the weather wasn't cooperating with him. They were going against the wind from the moment they left Israel. It seemed like the things were against him. And sensing this, Paul says to the centurion, hey, we should probably not move out yet. Let's hang out here. Let's stay in Crete. This sounds great. Fair havens. Doesn't that just sound like a place you want to hang out for a while? Yeah, take me to fair havens. That's where I want to be. And in the spring, we'll get going again. But the men rejected this council because they were in a hurry. They had to get their grain shipped to Rome. They had to get to a suitable port. So they press on ahead of godly counsel. Listen, precious church, if you want to experience difficulty in your life, if that's what you want, then make rash decisions based on sheer impatience. We're told in the book of Psalms and Isaiah about the wisdom of waiting on the Lord. Now, I'm all for taking steps of faith. I'm all for doing that personally. I'm all for us doing that as a church. But there's a difference between stepping out when you sense God is leading you. Like, like I feel God is leading us when it comes to reopening here in a couple weeks. I feel like God is leading us. There's something different from that and just making a decision because you're just tired of waiting for an answer. A decision based on impatience. You know, there's that classic story in the book of Genesis where God has been telling Abraham for years, you are going to be the father of many nations. And Abraham says, oh, thank you, Lord. But, but there's one problem. Abraham doesn't have many kids. So it's hard to be the father of many nations when you don't have a kid. And Abraham waits, and Abraham waits, and Abraham waits. But you know the story, what happens. Eventually, he tries to help God out with his promise. He decides, and Sarah decides, hey, why don't you take Hagar, my handmaiden. And why don't you have a child with her? And Abraham says, boom, that sounds good to me. And, and he starts to help God out with this promise. Well, <laughs> you can look at the world today and you see the myriad of problems that are happening in the year 2020 because Abraham pushed ahead and wouldn't wait for God to fulfill the promise. Ishmael is born. And, 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 and even Abraham himself says about Ishmael, well, can't, can't he just live before you? Can't he be the fulfillment of your promise? And God says, no, 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 I'm not going to honor this move that you made in the flesh. And listen to me, church, we can do the same thing. We can push out because we're tired of waiting. We can push out because we're tired of our circumstances. But the wisdom this morning is to wait on the Lord. Until you know what he's telling you to do. Until you have direction from him. Don't make a move. Wait on the Lord. Minister to him. Love on him. Wait for him to give you direction through his word, through godly counsel, through a word of wisdom, whatever. Wait on the Lord. You want a storm? You want a trial? Well, move out in impatience and you absolutely will. Another thing that can produce trials in our lives? Well, the second thing is they were seeking to fulfill the flesh. 
Now, this is a little hidden behind the scenes, so listen close. But the sailors, the captain, they don't want to spend the winter in fair havens. And yes, part of that was because it wasn't the best location being sheltered from these winds that were coming from you know, the north and from, from the east of where they were. That's certainly true, but there was more to it than that. Fair Havens was a sleepy little town. There wasn't much to do there. They had a place in mind they wanted to go. They wanted to go to Phoenix. Now, that's not Phoenix, Arizona. That's a harbor also on the island of Crete, about 40 miles where they were from in Fair Havens. Now, the thing about their, their, their location there in Fair Havens is boring. There were no bars. There were no brothels. There were no sandy beaches at that harbor. But in Phoenix, oh, that was known for its debauchery and its sin. And so that's where they wanted to spend the winter because that's what they wanted to do. They wanted to fulfill their flesh. And so because of it, they moved out and moved into the storm. And again, how we need to see that here today. If we're not careful, the same thing will happen with you and me. When we stop making decisions based on what God said and what's best for us spiritually and for our family spiritually, when we start to make decisions based on what our flesh wants, what we can please the more base desires of ourselves to increase our funds only, well, that's when storms begin to brew in our lives. Again, an illustration from Abraham's life, this time from his nephew Lot. You remember the flocks and herds began to grow with Lot and Abraham. And Abraham says to his nephew Lot, hey, you go west, I'll go east. I'll go east, you go west. You tell me where you're going, I'll go the opposite direction. Where do you want to go, nephew? And Lot said he looked out and he saw the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he saw that they were well watered like the garden of God. Like Egypt is what he says they look like. He had been to Egypt with his uncle Abraham and he saw what it was like down there in the world and Egypt is just a picture all through the scriptures of, of the world and sin. And Lot looks at Sodom. He knew it was a wicked place. That news travels fast. He knew it was a terrible place to grow in his relationship with the Lord, but it was well watered. It looked like a great place to raise cattle and I don't know how he justified it. Maybe he thought, I can make so much money raising cattle that I can give my kids everything they need. And that will be the best thing for my kids, to give them everything they've ever wanted. I don't know how he justified it. We'll make some money here and then we'll leave before they get old enough to be infected by the culture. I I don't know what Lot was thinking, but he chose to go the way of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it cost him dearly, didn't it? It cost him those kids he was so cared about. It cost him his family. It cost him his his, his relationship with the Lord was just tattered by the end of it. And and I just look at that and I say, man, we we have the tendency to do the same things. We look and say, I'm going to make this decision and it's best for me. It's best for what I want to do. Maybe, Maybe it's best for the pocketbook. Do we ask, God, is this what you want me to do? Is this the best thing for my family spiritually? Is this where they're going to grow in the Lord and mature in their relationship with God? Or am I making these decisions based solely on the baser needs of my flesh? You see, if you want a life that is troublesome, that's what you do. You move out in impatience. You decide to follow your heart into sinful things. And I promise you, your life will be a topsy-turvy experience of storms. But of course, none of us want that. None of us want that. So what do we do? We do the opposite. We wait patiently for the Lord. We let His Word be our guide and guard our hearts, not our flesh. But sometimes even when we do that, we still experience storms. And we've talked about this before, so I'll be brief. But, you know, we experience storms for a wide variety of reasons, don't we? They're not all the same. And the enemy's so quick to get in our ear and say, oh, the reason you're in this storm is God hates you. The reason you're in this storm is God has abandoned you. That's, that's never the reason. When I open up the Bible, what do I see? He does send storms for reasons in our lives. Sometimes he sends storms for correction. I think of Jonah, don't you? Jonah was called by God to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and preach the gospel, preach the good news. And, 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 and what did Jonah do? He took a boat in the opposite direction. <laughs> and so what did God do? God prepared a storm. God prepared a storm. Why? Because he hated Jonah? No, because he loved Jonah and he wanted to get Jonah back on track. And you know, that happens with you and me. 
Sometimes I move out in impatience. Sometimes I'm trying to honor my flesh. And all of a sudden, what happens? A storm develops, not because God is angry, not because God has abandoned me, but because God is trying to use the situation in your life to draw you back to him. And if you come before the Lord and say, God, why am I going through this? And he starts to put on your heart because of this thing you did and that thing you did. Hey, it's time to repent and get back right with God. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants the storm to be over. So repent. Sometimes God sends storms for correction. Sometimes he sends them for perfection. Sometimes he's not not trying to correct anything. He's just trying to work things into you that can get worked in no other way. I think of the disciples, man. They went through some storms like that, right? After a big day of ministry in Matthew chapter 14, they had just seen Jesus feed 5,000 men plus women and children. And as they're back on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus says, you go over to the other side and I'll meet you there. He goes up on a hilltop to pray, but that night a storm breaks out on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus comes to them there on the storm and you think, man, these guys were just trying to serve the Lord. Why would God allow them to go to the storm? He actually put them in the middle of that storm. Why would he do that? Well, he wasn't correcting, he was perfecting. He was teaching them to trust in him. He had said, he had said, you're going to go over to the other side. Now we get to see if we believe what God says, are we going to trust our feelings and our circumstances? He was teaching them important lessons. And sometimes that's what God does with us. He's working things into you that can get worked in no other way. And who knows what you need for heaven and eternity and the world that is in front of you. Sometimes God brings storms for correction, sometimes for perfection. But we see here in Acts chapter 27, an even different reason. Sometimes it's just for direction. God wasn't correcting Paul. He was correcting the sailors a little bit, but he wasn't correcting Paul. And I don't think he was necessarily working things into Paul, though he was learning to trust God in this time. But really, I think he's directing Paul's life. Because what we'll get into next week, next Sunday, next Wednesday, we'll get to chapter 28 and we'll see Paul on the island of Malta. And this fabulous church is going to be planned on the island of Malta, but here's the reality. Malta was not on the itinerary. (laughs) Malta was not where the Romans were going. They going, They were going to Rome to bring their grain, not to Malta. The grain ship was headed for Rome, not Malta. The prisoners were headed for Rome, not Malta. And so God sends a storm to get Paul where he needed to be, where he wanted to use him. And church, hear me on this. Sometimes you and I experience difficulties, a loss of a job, a loss of a, of a loved one, and we think, God, what are you doing? Have you abandoned me? Have you lost control? No, he hasn't, precious church. Since the moment you became his, even before that, right, you have been in his hand. And that isn't any different in this moment now. And maybe you won't see it till tomorrow. Maybe it'll be next week, next month, next year. Maybe you won't figure it out until you step into eternity and you say, God, why'd that happen in my life? But what you will eventually know for sure, I know, is that God was with you in the storm. He was with you trying to correct things that needed to be corrected. He was with you perfecting things that needed to be perfected. And he was with you directing you exactly where you needed to go. And though the human emotion wants to say, why God, what are you doing? We need to remember that God does nothing arbitrarily. He always has a purpose in mind. He always has something that he is doing. So Pastor Jason, which one is it? Am I in this storm because I'm being corrected? Am I in the storm because I'm being perfected? Am I in the storm because I'm being directed? What is it, Pastor Jason? I don't know. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through. I hardly sometimes know why I'm going through what I'm going through. What kind of pastor are you? Yeah, good question. But here's what you do. The Lord knows. So you go to him. God, am I off track on something? You just want to correct me. Are you trying to work things into me that I've been learning about you? Are you trying to get me to a place that I would never go apart from the trial in my life? We go to the Lord and then one more thing, look at, look at what Paul tells him to do, verse 21, and we'll be, we'll be done. It says, but after a long absence of food, when Paul stood in the midst of them, he said, men, you should have listened to me and have not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. 
For there stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed, God has granted all of those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe that God, I believe God that it'll be just as it was told to me. Paul gets up there in front of all of them. And now, I mean, when he starts this journey, he's a nobody, right? He's a nobody. He's this prisoner of Rome. This nobody, nobody even wants to know his name. Why know his name? He's going to Rome, maybe dead soon. When he gives advice about sailing, no doubt the sailors were like, oh, just shut it, you tent maker. What are you, what are you doing? But now he's the captain, isn't he? Now God has brought him to the place where he says, hey guys, you should have listened to me. <laughs> Don't you kind of hate it when people do that? Oh, you should have listened to me. You should have did what I told you. Paul tells them, you should have listened to me. But then Paul tells them, trust the Lord. God made me a promise last night that he was going to see us all to Rome. And this ship's going to be lost, but not a single life will be lost as we continue to cling to him and trust him. I think that's such a good word, I would say, specifically if you're going through a trial this morning. Maybe you are going through a trial because you did something wrong. You made a poor decision. And God is just working things in your life, trying to get you back on track. You are in this trial because you did not listen to the Lord. But hear the heart of the Lord. He's not saying to you, how come you didn't listen to me? (laughs) Paul was a human being just like us. But God's not saying that. He's not saying, why didn't you listen to me? You should have listened to me. But here's his heart. Are you ready to listen to him now? See, you're in the midst of a trial because you didn't listen to him, but now God has, now God has something for you to do from this day forward. You see, if you've gotten to a trial because you didn't listen, there's no time like the present to start listening, to start obeying, to start doing what God is telling you to do. Maybe you're in the trial because God's trying to work things into you that, that can be worked in no other way. What are you to do? Same thing Paul says to do. It's time for us to listen to the Lord. God, what do you want me to learn? I don't want to just go through this trial continually complaining, God, let it be over, let it be over, let it be over, let it be over. I want to change my prayer to God, what do you want me to learn? What do you want me to hear? What are you trying to perfect in my heart? I'm tired of arguing with you. What do you want me to know? And start listening. Start listening to what God speaks to you through the word, through godly counsel. Maybe... Maybe you're in a trial and God's directing you somewhere. Praise the Lord. I think so much in this world right now, we think, boy, this is not, this is not what I had planned for 2020. Some of you seniors that graduated high school this year or starting college, it's like, this is not what I planned for my life when I set out. But what's God doing? He hasn't abandoned you. He's using this crazy world that we're in And he's getting you right exactly where you need to be. And wise is the man and wise is the woman that says, I trust you. And there's no time like the present to tune my ear into what God is wanting me to wanting me to hear. God, where do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? You've thrown all my plans into the air, but you did it on purpose. So what do you want to accomplish? What do you want to do? Because Lord, I am your servant. I am a follower of you. Every time I get off that track, it is trouble and pain. But when I follow you, man, are things always easy? No, but I'm right where I'm supposed to be. And your presence is thick upon my life. That's what I want, don't you? Well, then in your trial, no matter what it's for, it's time to stop and it's time just to listen. God, what are you trying to say to me? There's no time like the present to start listening and start obeying the Lord. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray. Father, 